The NEBOSH General Certificate has never been an easy qualification to achieve. So here are five tips that if you implement them will drastically improve your chances of success. Tip number one is don't underestimate the challenge. The NEBOSH National General Certificate no longer involves a invigilated closed book exam where you'd turn up to an examination centre and you weren't allowed to take any notes or materials in there with you. And that was the thing that tended to scare most people that took the course. These days, the qualification is assessed by an open book exam that you complete at home with full access to the internet and all of your course materials, obviously no invigilator, and the other thing is you get a full 24 hours to complete the exam. And all that might sound very easy, but you would be making a big mistake by thinking that it's gonna be easy. The reason is that NEBOSH hasn't just changed the exam from a closed book to an open book. They've also changed the format of the exam questions. So with the old style closed book exam questions, that was really testing your, uh, your knowledge and your memory. So if you were able to cram all of this information in your head and recall the information at will, in the exam room, you would probably do quite well just based on having a good memory. Now the exam questions have changed. It's no longer about assessing your memory and your recall. Now the exam questions have been reformatted and it's now about testing your ability to really understand the concepts and apply them to the scenario that's set out in the exam question. Tackling these new format exam questions is more challenging than you're probably thinking. And unless you're bringing your A game to the table on exam day, you are gonna start struggling pretty much from the first question because you'll soon realize that having all of your notes available and being able to access information on the internet doesn't actually help as much as you think it might. You're gonna start struggling with the first exam question and that's gonna put you on a negative downward spiral. You're gonna start getting stressed and losing confidence. So yeah, the new NEBOSH open book exam format is definitely challenging, but no, it's not impossible as long as you don't underestimate the challenge involved. Tip number two is to plan your work and then work your plan. So now that we understand that it's a challenge, it's a big syllabus, you need to plan your time so that you can do the requisite amount of studying. Everyone's different when it comes to how much time they need to study uh, material but I would say as a minimum you need to be looking at getting in at least a hundred hours of studying to prepare adequately for this exam. So that's equivalent to two and a half weeks of a full-time job and if you've already got a full-time job that you're fitting this around you're obviously going to be looking at a much longer time frame to prepare for the exam than two and a half weeks. So let's say you set your sights on an exam day that's 12 weeks into the future. In order to get your hours in, you're gonna to need to do just over eight hours a week of studying. That's not too bad, but unless you plan how you're gonna do that from the outset, what's probably gonna happen is a couple of weeks are gonna go by and then you'll realize that oh dear, you haven't done any studying at all. And that will, right from the get-go, that will put you on the back foot. And anyone who's got a typical range of adult responsibilities will understand how easily that can happen, that sort of two weeks can go by 
and you fully intended to do um, eight hours a week of studying, but two weeks have flown by and you haven't done anything. So from day one, what I think you need to do is figure out, according to your schedule, how are you going to get these eight hours a week in? Are you going to do a couple of hours a night, you know, Monday through Thursday? Or will it work better for you to do your studying over the weekend, maybe four hours on the Saturday, four hours on the Sunday? Only you know what's best for you. So once you've given it some thought and you've worked out where you're going to do these study hours, get it in the calendar and make sure that those study hours are protected and that they don't clash with anything else that you've got going on in your life. Now comes the hard part. You've planned your work, now you've got to work your plan. That means that if you're scheduled to do some studying on a particular day, you've got to do it. Make it a non-negotiable for yourself that you get this studying done. If you've got two hours to do and you need to split it up over the day, maybe doing half an hour here, half an hour there, fine, or do an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, whatever. But just make sure that you stick to your plan. It will be worth it. This qualification can open doors for you and provide you with advantages for the rest of your career. So plan your work and then work your plan. Tip number three is take breaks. This tip can apply to studying in general, but what I'm focusing on with this is the actual exam day itself. You have a full 24 hours to complete the qualification, but obviously you're not expected to be working for the full 24 hours. So it's worth thinking ahead and thinking about where you're going to, how you're going to structure your day. And again, this is going to be different for for everybody. For me, I'd probably want to look at getting a good couple of hours, a block of a couple of hours in, in the morning before lunch, and then have a break for lunch. And then after lunch, get another couple of hours in, and then take a a fairly long mid-afternoon break, and then take, do another couple of hours uh, late afternoon, and then have tea, and then I think what I would do is make a decision on when I whether I do any, put in another couple of hours after tea, probably take that decision at the time, depending on how, the, how it's gone so far. But what I would definitely do is get a good night's sleep and then wake up nice and early the following day to take advantage of that time period before when you need to submit the exam paper by 9 a.m. because you'll have had a good night's sleep, your brain will have been mulling things over, and you can definitely do some good work for at least a couple of hours before you're having to submit your exam paper at 9 a.m. So personally, I'd be looking to take advantage of that uh, period in the early morning to get some more work done there. So that's about four two-hour study periods with long breaks between them. But what I would also look to do is to build in breaks within those two hour study periods. According to research, most people's attention span and levels of concentration tend to drop rapidly after about 25 to 30 minutes. And what I think most people will have the tendency to do on exam day is start working as soon as they get access to the exam paper and then just continue going. If you try and slog it through a full two hours, it might feel like you've done two hours work, but really you've only done about half an hour's, of, half an hour's worth of intense studying and uh, intense concentration. So a good technique, it's called the Pomodoro technique, where you get a timer on your phone or or on your computer. Uh, You can just basically Google the Pomodoro technique and there's loads of apps that you can get that can do this for you. But what happens is it times 25 minutes, an alert will go off after 25 minutes. 
That's Google. The alarm will go off after 25 minutes, which is your signal to get up, get away, have a break. It doesn't take long to recharge your focus and bring it back to almost 100% co uh, concentration again. So you go away, you have a break for, ten, uh, for five minutes, you come back, you do another 25 minutes, then a five minute break, then you come back, you do another 25 minutes, then a five minute break, and then a fourth 25 minute period. So that will be two hours, but you will have studied for, or you will have worked with high levels of concentration for a full 100 minutes, because that's four 25 minute periods. So that, that's gonna yield better results than trying to slog it through one continuous block of two hours. Uh, I've tried this technique myself and it's surprising how well it can work. What happens is two hours you know, fly by because you're more engaged and, and you're not getting as frustrated or bored with, the, uh, with working on it. It doesn't seem like so much of a slog. So it's worth trying out that technique and see whether it works for you. Tip number four is to adapt your approach. The type of exam that most people are going to be familiar with is the type of exam that you used to all where it's a closed book exam. You go into the exam hall, uh, you can't take anything in there with you. It's invigilated and, and you've got to have got, go in there with all of the information that you need crammed inside, inside your head. And that type of exam what it tended to do is test your ability to memorize and recall information. And so the revision techniques that would have been utilized with that end in mind would have been focused on things like flashcards and active recall, basically rote memorization techniques. Open book exams aren't about testing your memorization and recall abilities though. Open book exams are more about testing your ability to critically analyze information, really understand it, and then apply it to a scenario. Now that the NEBOSH exam questions are of this open book type, it's no longer sufficient just to be able to memorize information. A major misconception is that with open book exams you don't really need to study for them since you're going to have access to your materials and the internet when you're doing the exam. But this is the way to think about it. The examiner doesn't want recalled facts. What they want is for you to show a deeper understanding of the content and how it applies to the scenario. And having access to your notes and materials isn't necessarily going to help with that unless you've done the background work to really make sure that you do genuinely understand these concepts and principles that are covered in the syllabus. Just being able to recall facts is actually regarded as lower order thinking as opposed to understanding and applying knowledge which is regarded as higher order thinking. This means that in order to succeed, you've got to fully embrace the fact that when you're writing your exam answers, you're not writing to demonstrate just your knowledge and your memorization of the facts. You're writing to demonstrate your understanding of the concepts and principles and how to apply them to the scenario. To do this successfully, you'll need to develop different writing skills. Summarising or restating information from other sources won't work on its own. This type of writing is sometime, sometimes known as descriptive writing, but it doesn't demonstrate that you understand the material, just that you can restate it or summarise it. With descriptive writing, you're not really making a point or developing an opinion or an argument. So you need to go beyond descriptive writing and use something that's called critical writing. With critical writing, you're developing your own opinions and arguments about the concepts that are relevant to the scenario and you're communicating them and you're backing up your opinions and arguments with evidence from 
the research that you've that you've carried out to develop this approach this critical writing approach you need to when you're doing your research is consider the relevance of the information that you're looking at when you're carrying out your research think about how it can be integrated into the point that you're making or the argument that you're trying to develop and identify positive and negative aspects of the information that you can comment on. A much higher level of skill is needed for critical writing than descriptive writing and you will need to practice it before you start getting the hang of it. The fifth and final tip is to use the full word count allowance. So the word count is 3,000 words for the entire exam with a 10% leeway. So basically that's 3,300 words. And if you're turning in your paper, if you're submitting it with something like 2,000 words, which is what some people are doing, then to be honest with you, you might as well forget it. There's different amounts of points available for each question. So some questions are worth 10 points, some questions are worth 15, some questions are worth 20, etc. But what you'll see is there will always be a number in brackets to the right that tells you how many points are available for that particular question. And you should use that as a rough guide to how many points you should be making and how many words you should be writing for that particular question. So for example, if a question is worth 10 points, then you should be striving to make 10 different points in your answer and be writing somewhere between 100 and 110 words. If you can't do that, then you need to either take a break, especially if you've been working on it for more than half an hour because your concentration levels are going to be pretty low anyway, or you need to carry on researching, thinking about how you can use the information that you come across during your research to flesh out your answer, or leave the question alone for now, move on, and then come back to it later when your brain has had a chance to process the information a little bit more. But whatever you do, don't give up. Don't give up on yourself because the, for you, the challenge is not over. Now, you may not be a runner, but anyway, think about this scenario. Ask yourself this question. If you were to turn up for a uh, 3000 meter running race, running event, and then you decided that after 2000 meters, you were just going to give up because it was too difficult. Are you that type of person? Because that's exactly what you're doing when you decide that you're just going to turn in your exam paper with only 2000, 2000 words on it. That's nearly half of the words missing. On average, there are about 15 to 20 words in a sentence in English and about five sentences per paragraph. Now, the simple fact is that you're probably not going to pick up marks for every sentence that you write, but as long as you've put a reasonable amount of effort in, you are probably going to pick up enough marks across the entire paragraph to accumulate enough points to pass the exam. Now, obviously, I can't give any guarantees except this one. You're not going to get any points at all for words, sentences and paragraphs that you haven't even written. I hope you've got some value out of the video that you've just seen. If so, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to the channel so that you can be alerted to when we produce and upload more videos.